to address five questions that have arisen after my webinar last week. So I'll get stuck into the first one. How can hazard reduction burning be more adaptive to climate change? If our application of hazard reduction burning is gonna be more adaptive, we're gonna to have to come to grips with some confronting new realities. Parts of the landscape that we could previously rely on being damp enough to pull up fires like wet gullies and rainforests or damp mountaintops are becoming drier and more combustible. The fire season is getting longer. The days on which we can safely burn, uh, do hazard reduction burning, are getting fewer. So in this really increasingly challenging context, we have to be more strategic in the placement and the conduct of any hazard reduction burning that we do do. And the science tells us the closer we place our hazard reduction burns to the assets we're trying to protect, the more effective those burns are going to be in reducing risks. And government coffers just aren't sufficiently deep to take a scattergun approach and hope that by burning hundreds of thousands of hectares annually in patches across the landscape, we're going to achieve a major reduction in the loss of life and property. The science already tells us that the reduction in losses achieved by such an approach is really modest. You might wish it was more effective, but that's not what the evidence suggests. We simply can't and we don't want to burn everywhere, so we need to target what burning we will do to those locations which will give us the greatest return, where we'll we the most effective in reducing the risk to the things we value. So if we are genuinely to be adaptive to the challenges posed by climate, climate change, we need to focus more on where we burn, not just how much. The second question I was asked was, how does hazard reduction burning promote healthy species and ecosystem diversity. And in answering this question, I wanna make a really important distinction between hazard reduction burning and ecological burning. Hazard reduction burning's primary objective is reducing the extent and severity of uncontrolled bushfires. The objective of ecological burning is to maintain ecological communities of plants and animals that may require a particular fire regime to persist and thrive. To give you an example, I'm involved in a long-term research project at Wilson's Promontory National Park where we're using a very hot ecological burn to control coast tea tree and coast wattle. And those two species are invading a threatened coastal grassy woodland. So in this case, we're adding fire to the landscape to restore and maintain ecosystem health. There are other parts of the park that, may, that we may want to protect from bushfires to ensure their health to keep fire out, for example, from cool temperate rainforest gullies. And this might indeed involve hazard reduction burning to reduce fuels in the areas adjacent to those fire sensitive ecosystems. So in this case, the asset we are trying to protect in our hazard reduction burning is actually an ecological asset. And our goal is to reduce the likelihood that a subsequent bushfire will spread into our fire sensitive rainforest gully. So yes, Fire can be used to promote ecosystem health, but the devil is in the detail. Different ecosystems need different fire regimes and one size does not fit all. The next question I've been asked is, has the southeast of Australia thoroughly explored using more extensive cool burn programs? Well, the answer is yes. The effectiveness of using extensive cool burn programs in southeastern Australia has been examined by a number of scientific studies, and the best estimates we have to date indicate that its effectiveness in reducing loss of life and property is modest on the most extreme day fire days. Multiple studies have shown us that, and these are the days we need to worry about because these are the days when people die. In addition, from the data I've been able to examine in Victoria, the greatest level of prescribed burning that I can see in the historic record was in the 1980s, early 1980s, when in one year over 300,000 hectares was burnt. And yet we still suffered the tragic losses of Ash Wednesday bushfires in 1983, just two years later. So I think the focus needs to be much more on the strategic location of burning rather than simply the extent. This was acknowledged in the Bushfires Royal Commission in 2009, where they wrote, the targets must, however, take into consideration 
the fact that each hectare burned is not of equal value and the location of prescribed burns affects the effectiveness of risk reduction. In Victoria, we have tried to implement a statewide hectare based target to burn a rolling average of 385,000 hectares a year. When we did that, there was a demonstrable mismatch between where we burnt and where the risks were. And this left the government vulnerable to accusations that they had burnt where it was cheaper to conduct hazard reduction burning in order to meet the hectare target rather than where it would achieve the greatest reduction in risk to life and property. And an independent assessment by former police commissioner Neil Comrie recommended a shift to a focus on reducing risk rather than simply on burning to meet a target. So I think the focus needs to be much more strategic in the location of burning rather than simply extent as I've said before. And we need to be mindful of Victorian government's own estimates of how modest the reduction in risk is on those bad days when most of our losses occur. Just a three to 5% reduction in risk compared to if no hazard reduction burning had been done. And they're pretty sobering figures. The next question I've been asked is, what contemporary factors affected our ability to control the 2019-20 bushfires? Now, there are four switches or dials that affect the ferocity or spread of bushfires. Obviously, you need a source of ignition like lightning or arson. But after that, the other three switches are the ones that matter. And they are the amount and arrangement of plant material, the proportion of that plant material that's dry enough to burn, and the weather on the day, the temperature, humidity, and wind strength. The scientific analyses that have been published in the peer review literature indicate that two major factors influence the extent and ferocity of this season's fires. The extreme, firstly, the extreme drought conditions in the preceding three years and the resultant drying out of the plant material, making much more of it available dry enough to burn. And when you couple that with repeated bursts of extreme fire weather, we got this shocking result that we found. Now, some have pointed to the amount of plant material available, but that might have changed all that much from the preceding years when we didn't have such catastrophic fires. What was changing was the condition of that plant material as it dried out and more and more of it became combustible and available to burn. Whereas previously damper parts of the forest could be relied on to slow down or pull up the spread of the fire, we had three years of record breaking drought, the driest three years in, on record and the hottest year on record, all of which primed our landscape to burn. So regrettably, we saw places burn that have never burned before. Sadly, this is precisely what was predicted in the Garno report in 2008. And they prophetically wrote, Recent projections, this is 2007, a report in 2007. Recent projections of fire weather suggest that fire seasons will start to start earlier, end slightly later, and generally be more intense. This effect increases over time, but should be directly observable in 2020. So these conditions that we've just been through were unprecedented, but regrettably they were not unexpected. The next question I've been asked to address is, given the complexities of hazard reduction burning, would it be easier, safer and cheaper to only focus on suppression of bushfires? Well, no. While hazard reduction is not without risks or costs, it remains an important component of a suite of strategies to keep the things we value safe, and it can greatly assist suppression activities. But we need to be realistic and recognise that in a drying climate, Suppression by direct attack is going to be effective on fewer and fewer days. In this context, we need to be really sanguine about which of our strategies are going to be most cost effective and what we are hoping to achieve by adopting them. And I would argue that our primary concern should be saving human lives. If we considered the future threat of fire more like the threat of cyclones or tornadoes, we might prioritise strategies to reduce the threat of fires differently. We might instead prioritise getting people out of harm's way before the fire hits. So this could involve strategies like more rapid detection of ignitions and real-time mapping of fire spread, better communication infrastructure for remote communities, access to satellite phones, early warnings, clearer communications, better evacuation planning as we do for remote communities in the paths of cyclones, and better responsiveness to extract people in danger. 
perhaps better construction of public fire shelters and safe places, just as we do create such places for cyclone areas. Enforcing building codes and requirements for construction of buildings and private fire bunkers in fire prone areas as is done again for cyclone or tornado or earthquake rated areas. Enforcement of planning regulations where buildings or assets can or cannot be located based on their vulnerability to bushfire and the ease of getting out of those places when bushfires are running. And while we're doing everything we can to make people safer, we should also turn our attention to protecting other things we value, like our properties and our environment. And in that context, we need to do the cost benefit analysis of what does the most good and the least harm amongst the range of tools in our kit bag, whether it's hazard reduction burning or water bombing from aeroplanes, mulching, rolling, green fire breaks, whatever. We need to work out what works and why and what is the most cost effective way, both in dollar terms and environmentally for protecting the things we value. Thanks very much. Thank